when you negotiate with Amazon, you're not just negotiating with Amazon. You need to understand where your products are sold online and you need to take care of your distribution. Hello, I'm your host, John Cavendish, and welcome to season three of the Amazon Strategist Show. The show is all strategy, no hacks, no silver bullets, just real practical strategies to grow your Amazon business. Today, I'm joined by our guest, Marco Tanteso of Sell It, It for Italia. So, Marco holds a master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics. However, his life's journey lent him in different directions. Marco has worked for two startups in London and founded and sold his own marketplace, not quite as big as Amazon, um, in Italy. So, Marco currently runs an agency that helps companies navigate um, and relevant marketplaces for their brands. So, Marco, welcome to the Amazon Strategist Show. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Well, and it's great to have you here. And, you know, I just thought we could start a little bit with your journey, because I know you lived in London, I assume, for studying at LSE. You know, what was your kind of journey to get to where you are now? That's a good question. So, well, I, I studied in London. Afterwards, I managed to land a couple of jobs over there. And the, I guess the one that got me most interested in was this marketplace for musicians and venues to, to organize gigs. I launched it and it was uh, a little successful. I guess uh, a few thousand people were booking gigs, but then COVID happened. And as you can imagine, uh, the live music industry got a big hit during COVID, obviously. So came back to Italy and uh, a friend of mine that was uh, running this digital marketing agency uh, was interested in what I was doing in London because he was also a musician and he launched his own startup in music. So I reached out to him saying, look, you have many clients. Do you have anyone that is looking for somebody to hire? And he said, I think you are a smart guy. So even though you don't know anything about marketing, I'm going to hire you anyway, and we're going to find something to do. Um, so in the beginning, we thought about launching an agency to help uh, uh, companies creating e-commerce website, but the investment necessary to hire developers to do so is quite big. Um, however, we noticed at the same time that a few of his clients had the, their products posted on Amazon, but the listings were created by the resellers, not by the brand itself. And you know that when resellers create listings, they don't tend to pay as much attention as when the brand creates the listing on its own, right? So I started studying uh, how to optimize the presence on Amazon. And I discovered that there is a whole world, obviously, behind this. Uh, starting from Helium 10, I mean, one of the most common softwares that people use to analyze uh, Amazon. And they have actually a very good school. It's free if you get the software. There are, I don't know how many hours, 80, 100 hours, I have no idea. Um, so I started studying uh, that piece of software at their school. And then started uh, getting clients from the old company, from the, from the digital marketing agency uh, to fix their presence online. And then from then on, we started creating this uh, business unit uh, vertical on, uh, on Amazon. Recently on other marketplaces as well, but 99% of times that's Amazon. Oh, that's amazing. It's very cool. And yeah, I like it's a good niche helping brands that have been sold to resellers because they already have brand recognition usually and brand presence. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's how we started. Obviously, it's not the only thing that we do, but, um, you know, Amazon, it's, uh, Amazon is the biggest search engine on the planet right now. I think it surpassed Google if, if you're looking at products, obviously, uh, the search engine for products. So these brands pay hundreds of thousands of euros to have their presence done properly on Meta, Google, and these other social networks. Um, and many times, especially talking about the Italian market, they don't pay as much attention to their online presence on Amazon. However, I believe that when the final customer, <clears throat> when me and you basically go on Amazon and look for a listing, you don't realize that it was a reseller that created the listing, but you think it's actually the brand that didn't pay that much attention, right? Um, so even the brand image, uh, I think gets affected negatively. Uh, by doing this. So yeah, that's how we got our foot through the door. Love it. And so the majority of your clients, Italian, Italian companies, 
Yeah, the majority is Italian. We do have a Swiss company. Uh, we do work for Italian companies that sell abroad. So we are working in Spain, France, Germany, UK, the biggest uh, Amazon markets across Europe. Um, but yeah, so this is what we do. Actually, we also have a brand store in the US. So started to reach out also overseas. No, that's very cool. And I think that's a great uh, takeaway for anyone that's listening to this episode who does want to help other companies to sell on Amazon is, you know, niche markets. I mean, Italy isn't really a niche, you know, 70 million people, but you know, that's a good thing, which is outside of what everyone else is doing. You know, there's a million agencies approaching US sellers, but if you speak French or Spanish or German, then you know, reaching out to those companies, there's a lot more trust, isn't there? Yeah. And actually, uh, one thing that I had in mind that I, I haven't actually started doing this properly, but I would love to create a network of agencies across different areas uh, where Amazon is present. So, you know, Amazon, it's in uh, Emirates, it's in Japan. So it is in other parts of the world. So I think that especially smaller independent agencies, it would make sense to create a network among ourselves. So if I have a client that wants to expand to Japan, and obviously I don't know the customs of Japan as much as someone who's local. So I'd love to create a network where we can pass over uh, my clients if they want to expand to other parts of the globe where it's a bit peculiar uh, to understand the culture uh, of, of the country itself. Well, I love it. And yeah, I mean, I think we have 250 or so agency partners. So if you ever need anything like that, feel free to reach out to us. We can, uh, we can put you in touch with someone in most marketplaces who can, uh, or even if you want to build your network, we can help you. Awesome. Cheers, John. Uh, love it. So now you've, you, you, you did Helium 10. Was that Kevin King who, who did that training? Yeah. Kevin King is part of many web, uh, of many videos indeed, but I think it's Bradley, uh, the person that it's the main, it's the main person. Yeah, absolutely. Kevin King. Yeah. All right. So you, you learn from the guys. And now you, you know, then you learn on sell on Amazon. So how did you kind of hone your skills and get better over time once you, once you've got your training? So experience, right? I mean, wh wh what else can you do if not actually selling products? And I guess difficult ones. One of, uh, one of the things that I found always funny is that I think actually Kevin King, one of the things that he said in the beginning is, uh, to stay away from, uh, supplement. Uh, when you launch on Amazon, because they're very peculiar in the sense that you need to avoid certain keywords. Like for instance, if you have something that helps you against the flu, you cannot say that on Amazon, right? You cannot say that it helps against the cold. Right. So they're quite tricky. And obviously that was the first client that we landed. So, uh, I started, I started learning, trying to avoid all of the cholesterol words, uh, all, all, all of these words. So. I guess learning by trying something hard, of course, it's one way of getting experience. And we managed to, uh, f since the very beginning, we tried to get as many clients as possible in different areas. Uh, so from alcoholic beverages, supplements, food, toys, electronics. So you have all these different uh, certifications that you need for each niche, uh, all the logics that are part of these, uh, of these products. So I guess trying to explore as many areas within Amazon as possible, and also trying to use all the tools that Amazon offers, try to get in touch with Amazon as much as you can, especially, I mean, obviously when you're small, you don't have a point of contact right straight away within Amazon that you can talk to. So participating in as many webinars that Amazon does. Sometimes here in Italy, they do events in uh, their headquarters in Milan. So even though we're not that close to them, try to go there as much as you can. Cause when you, at the end of the day, although Amazon is a massive corporations, right? Uh, it's made out of people. So if you manage to become friends with somebody within Amazon, then start to get a bit easier. Uh, they might point you in the right direction. So I guess. These are the ways that we've built our experience. Mm, I love that. I think there's two big takeaways there for me anyway, which is one, learn by doing. So, you know, take on as many clients or do as many niches as possible so that you can learn as quickly as possible through breadth of experience. And yeah, meeting the people. 
So, you know, I'm a big fan of going to conferences. You know, we usually exhibit at um, Prosper Show in Vegas in February, March, March, I think this year. And, you know, we're trying to get to more shows as well. So I think meeting people, meeting industry experts and meeting Amazon themselves, you know, as you said, once you know people inside, it's not the way to do things, but it's, it help. it always helps because nobody wants to see people they know, like, and trust. Exactly. Silly reasons. Exactly. Exactly. Recently we've been to a uh, fair. I, I think the word in English is fair. Uh, I hope it is, but th- <clears throat> there is a massive marketplace fair in Milan where obviously Amazon is there as well, even the other marketplaces. So even bringing some of our, uh, we have some potential new clients that are still thinking about joining Amazon because even though it's massive, I guess we still need to teach people why there is the need of approaching this marketplace. So even bringing physically uh, these potential new clients to meet with our partner within Amazon, not our partners, but the people we know within Amazon creates more bonding both toward the client and toward Amazon that sees you bringing some potential new business for them because I mean, these people uh, in Amazon, they have their own KPIs, right? They need to have their, uh, I don't know, advertising spend per year or re- total turnover that they need to manage. So if you can understand this and try to help them get, get their KPIs, reach their KPIs, then they tend to be a bit nicer when you need to ask for some help, no? Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, we're actually an Amazon partner agency now as well. So you know, it's great to bring people in and they get free, you know, you can get reps, you can get all sorts of other stuff, but especially if you start growing your relationship with Amazon, they'll start giving your clients more and more perks as, as you bring new people onto the platform. Exactly. Exactly. Super, super cool. Awesome. So we always ask all of our clients if they have a controversial take. So all that means is, is there any kind of debatable or controversial opinion you hold in the e-commerce industry? Um, and they call it a hot take in the US, but I've only ever heard that in America. So what's a controversial take? So I guess that right now, uh, the two main ones that have been happening uh, to us, they're quite old the topics, they're not brand new, but uh, I think they're hot right now. So of course, number one, I would say is negotiations with Amazon, especially if we refer to the 1P, right? To the, to the vendor accounts. So. We understand that Amazon needs to take care of their margins. Uh, Obviously, everyone needs to take care of their margins, right? And so we noticed though that they can be quite aggressive in how they negotiate, especially depending on who they're negotiating with. And it happened to us a few times that uh, weirdly enough, during the negotiation period, the the buy box actually disappeared during uh, on actually one of the best selling products of one of our clients. And um, they didn't just give the buy box to one of the resellers. Actually, that rectangle that's on the right hand side completely disappeared. And this has an impact on sales, right? So we completely understand that Amazon has its own scraping tools, right? To check the price of your products on other online retailers. And they need to match it, right? Amazon wants to be the place where you actually go and find the best price. Now, it's not always the case, but that's what they aim to do, right? So we understand that as a vendor, when you negotiate with Amazon, you're not just negotiating with Amazon. You need to understand where your products are sold online and you need to take care of your distribution. You need to understand that your price has to be coherent across all channels that you have. And this is not always the case. Sometimes there are brands that are too big to have complete control over every single place where their products is sold, right? Because they can be selling to a reseller that then sells the product again to another online retailer. So uh, this is not easy to, to check. However, we find very annoying and very aggressive from Amazon to actually take away the buy box during these negotiations, especially because if you don't have uh, the uh, AVS service, if you don't have a vendor manager, and unfortunately, you can only talk with the customer service. Every time you receive a different answer on why they removed the buy box, they're not, I, they're not. This is my opinion, keep in mind, right? And everyone has its own opinion. Uh, but we believe that they're not completely transparent when they reply to these questions. Uh, so this is something that I find fairly annoying. What, what, what do you think, John? 
Did, did it come up to you as well in your talks? Oh yeah, I mean I've I've seen that many many times. You know, buy box disappearing. You know, you get template. You know, if you go to customer service, as you know, you'll get templates back saying you don't comply with one of Amazon's many policies, whether that's your seller return rate, whether that's yeah. price matching somewhere on the internet which they've scraped, which they don't tell you where. It's uh, very frustrating and very difficult. Yeah, it is. So right now, for many of these clients, we're trying to check to see if the third-party option makes sense for them. Not every time, though, right? Because if you are a B2B brand, you're not used of the even just the accounting of the B2C uh, of the B2C stream, right? Taking care of all of the invoices, the receipts at the end of the month. So, so. You need to check the economics, if it is economically sustainable to move to the 3P. And it, it's not always the case, because um, especially if you use FBA, if you sell a products that, I guess, eyeballing this, but if the price is less than 15, 20 euros, that it might not be the best option, because uh, you still need to pay for uh, advertising, the 15% commission that Amazon takes, FBA. I mean, it sums up quite easily, no? So it's not always uh, it's not always the choice, but we tend to evaluate this as an option to not be locked into uh, the the first P uh, Amazon necessities. I don't know if this makes sense in English. <laughs> and like, I'm actually I've talked to at least two or three other agencies, because now agency is a different word, um, who have seen that as an, as a problem and solved it for their clients by becoming a distributor. So they, you know, they either take consignment, you know, consignment's the dream because there's no cash flow issues. Um, you know, they do five, 10, 15, 20, 30 million a year, just through a bunch of brands that then they, you know, they sell risk-free basically. Yeah, so they it's called the, off. it's called merchant of records, correct? This, this method of selling. Yeah. We, we're studying this as well. Uh, you just need to check the economics, right? Cause. You take a commission, Amazon takes a commission, the logistics take a commission. So it has to make sense. You need to have big margins for, for that model, I believe, to work. But yeah, absolutely. It's a good way because the way also brands, uh, one of the other issues of becoming a seller is that sometimes you don't want your resellers to know that you're actually actively selling on Amazon, right? It is a very, uh, very short-lived lie, uh, but sometimes brands do not want to show the resellers and obviously, if you become a seller, it becomes like you can see uh, either in your VAT or in the name of the store, so you can check who's selling. So indeed, the the merchant of records method would actually uh, solve this issue. Yeah, I love it. And um, very cool. I'm looking forward to hearing about you hitting 10, 20, 30 million <laughs> euros a year doing that for your clients. Me too, man. Me too. <laughs> love it. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. And uh, this was an amazing discussion. So thanks, Marco. Thanks for sharing your story, for your opinions and how you see the world, you know, the Amazon world. So thank you to all of our listeners who've been here. And if you want to connect with you, they want to talk about, you know, whether it's selling in Italy or selling in Europe, what's the best way to get in touch with you, Marco? I would say go on LinkedIn and look for indeed M-A-R-C-O. So Marco without the S at the end and then oh. Santesso. All right. Well, thanks so much for being here, Marco. And uh, it's been a great episode. Thank you, John. You made it easy though. It was very comfortable. Thank you, John. Very appreciated.